Hey everyone, uh, my name is One. If you don't know me, I get the privilege of uh, serving as one of the pastors here at Rooted Fellowship. Now we have been in a somewhat long sermon series. Uh, we've been navigating through the book of Exodus and, uh, and today is the grand finale. Uh, we are wrapping it up, we are shutting it down, we are closing this book. And it's been an incredible journey. I've received so many encouraging messages from many of you uh, via WhatsApp, uh, voice notes, emails, just deeply encouraged uh, by what God has been doing over these last uh, couple of weeks, uh, 13 weeks to be precise. This is the 13th week that we are in the book of Exodus. It's phenomenal. It's an incredible book, and, uh, and God has just been faithful uh, throughout this entire time. But we are wrapping it up today, all right? And so uh, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 40. If you have a Bible, I would encourage you to meet me in Exodus chapter 40. Uh, we're going to slow things down quite a bit, all right? We're going to walk through this section of the text uh, at a really slow pace because I think there's some really important things for us to see here. And even in saying that, I'm still not going to cover everything, all right? This speaks to the fact that this section of the text is, is very dense, uh, but it still has uh, amazing golden nuggets that continue to reveal who God is and what that means for us. And, and that's what we always do as we come to the text. We want to see who God is and, and what that means for, for us as his people, right? And so Exodus 40 is where we will be. But we need to start at Exodus chapter 36, right? So Exodus 40 is where we'll be. Uh, but to understand that chapter, we actually need to go back a couple chapters and go to Exodus 36. I'm going to start in verse 8, all right? And this is the beginning of a long section that actually ends the book of Exodus. It's where the tabernacle is described. Now, this uh, had been previously mentioned uh, in the book of Exodus a couple of chapters uh, before. Uh, but now what we're going to see here is this tabernacle now being built, right? It's actually being built, and it's something quite magnificent. Uh, for example, in Exodus chapter 36, verse 8, through to verse 13, it, it describes how they made uh, the curtains of uh, an artistic design of cherubim. Uh, it is what was commanded back in Exodus chapter 26, but here, now in Exodus 36, it's going to be fulfilled. And so let me read these verses, and I want you to listen to the detail. All right, so God is giving a command to uh, the Israelites to build this tabernacle under the leadership of Moses, but God is incredibly detailed with his instructions. And so from verse 8 of chapter 36, it says, All the skilled artisans among those doing the work made the tabernacle with ten curtains. Bezalel made them of finely spun linen as well as blue, purple, and scarlet yarn with a design of cherubim worked into them. Each curtain was 42 feet long, about 12 meters, and 6 feet wide, which is almost 12 meters wide. All the curtains had the same measurements. He, he joined five of the curtains to each other, and the other five curtains he joined to each other. He made loops of blue yarn on the edge of the last curtain in the first set, and he did the same on the edge of the outermost curtain in the second set. Remember the detail. Verse 12, he made 50 loops on the one curtain and 50 loops on the edge of the curtain in the second set so that the loops lined up with each other. He also made 50 gold clasps and joined the curtains to each other so that the tabernacle became a single unit. It's incredible, absolutely incredible. And it doesn't end here. Chapter after chapter after chapter, we see detail after detail after detail. Clear instructions on the design and the build of this tabernacle. Now, I know some of you are probably wondering, where did they get all this material from, right? I mean, we're seeing yarn and, and we're going to see gold and we're going to see all sorts of beautiful material. Where did it come from? I, I thought the Israelites... 
uh, were slaves. They, they had spent 400 years under the, the oppression and slavery of, of the Egyptian rule. And so where did they get all this material from? I'm glad you asked. All of this came from the generosity of the people. We see this in Exodus chapter 36, verse 6. Let me read it to you. It says, after Moses gave an order, they sent a proclamation throughout the camp. Let no man or woman make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. So the people stopped. The materials were sufficient for them to do all the work. There was more than enough. Gosh, I, I believe that this is the prayer for many church leaders all around the world, that, that they would live in, in such a state that they always have more than enough. So much that, that they would actually ask the people to stop giving. I mean, think about that for a moment. Stop giving. You are being way too generous, so stop giving. We have more than what we need. This is profound because the, the, the Israelites, if you've been tracking with us, were, were a rebellious, idolatrous, sinful people. And so where did all this generosity come from? Well, if you were with us last week, you would have seen that God renewed his covenant with the Israelites after the golden mistake, right, the golden calf. God says, okay, look, guys, I cannot... Let sin go unpunished. And, and Moses intercedes with prayer. And he says, please, would you give grace uh, to your people? And, and God uh, gives grace and he gives mercy. And then he reveals who he is. Because Moses says, show me your glory. And, and so God says, okay, let me show you who I am. And, and, and in that, we see that God is a God of covenant. And so he renews his covenant with his people. And so the people are blown away by the generosity of God. God's grace, that they are compelled to be a generous people themselves. And so when God gives the instructions for the building of this tabernacle, and he says, I want you to bring, bring the materials so that we might build, they're just bringing and bringing and bringing and bringing. What a generous people. We must also remember that the Israelites would have carried a lot of these materials from Egypt. We know that Moses had asked the people of Israel to ask the Egyptians, this is way back at the beginning of Exodus, uh, he asked the Israelites to ask the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing as they were leaving Egypt. These were given to the Israelites in large enough quantities for Exodus to record this as if the, the Israelites were plundering the Egyptians. But don't take my word for it, let me... Uh, remind you by going back to Exodus chapter 12, verses 25 and 26, where uh, it says, well, verses 35, sorry, and 36, where it says, the, the Israelites acted on Moses' word and asked the Egyptians for silver and gold items and for clothing. Verse 36, and the Lord gave the people such favor with the Egyptians that they gave them what they requested. In this way, they plundered the Egyptians. And so Moses says, listen, God wants you guys to go and request to the Egyptians all this material and God will grant you favor and they will give you everything. It will be as if we have plundered the Egyptians. This goes all the way back to Exodus 3 where God made the promise to the Israelites that when he liberates them, they will not leave empty-handed. Exodus chapter 3 from verse 19, where it says, however, I know that the king of Egypt will not allow you to go even under force from a strong hand. But when I stretch out my hand, this is God speaking, and strike Egypt with all my miracles that I will perform in it, after that, he will let you go. And I will give these people such favor with the Egyptians that when you go, you will not go empty Handed. Each woman will ask her neighbor and any woman staying in her house for silver and gold jewelry and clothing, and you will put them on your sons and daughters, so you will plunder the Egyptians. See, God had made provision already way back in Exodus 3 for what he was going to do in Exodus 36 to 40. God knows what he's doing, 
And so we are called to trust him. He will provide that which he commands us to do. We see it here in Exodus. In fact, we can page through scripture and we'll see it over and over and over again. That which he calls us to do, he will provide for. And so we should trust. We should believe, keeping our eyes on him. And so that's where all the material comes from. But let's go back to the building of the tabernacle. This tent, uh, some translations refer to it as such, and so this tent, this tabernacle, would be a a sort of portal temple that Israel would build and that they would keep with them throughout their wandering in the wilderness. And on the outside of this tent, just like you would on any tent, you had coverings made of different materials. Uh, There was a curtain of goat's hair, There was a curtain of ram's skin that was dyed red and a curtain of badger's skin. Then there was uh, the boards connecting the bars from the frame and the walls of the tabernacle. And then later in Exodus uh, chapter 36, it describes the veil and the screen and the pillars. And all these things were discussed previously in the book of Exodus, but now they are actually going to be built. And so you can imagine the Israelites talking about this, like, hey, God has been mentioning this tabernacle and all this material that would be put together to build it. When will it happen? Now is the time. Now is the time. And so I can only imagine the excitement. I mean, have you ever been involved in a building project or any project You start talking about it, you dream about it, you discuss it, but the game changes when you start talking detail, when you start taking measurements, when you start putting a budget together. Now it's becoming real. That's what's happening here in the text. Exodus chapter 37 describes the construction of the tabernacle furniture. Verse 1 to 5, you have the Ark of the Covenant. And this is what symbolized God's throne among the people of Israel. And then there was also the mercy seat. We see this in verses 6 and 9 of chapter 37. Verses 10 and 16 is the description of what is known as the table of showbread. This table symbolized Israel's daily fellowship with God. Just like you and I eat bread every day, they were to come and fellowship with God every day. So the bread was set before God in the tabernacle as a picture of that eating together, that tabling together. As the expression goes, we are breaking bread together. Chapter 37 also mentions the golden lampstand. Uh, That was the light of Israel, the light of the tabernacle. And with this, we can make an easy connection to Jesus as he is the light of the world. And so already we're seeing prophecy. We're seeing God saying, I'm I'm wanting you to put this together, but there's a plan in motion for your salvation. Then you also have in chapter 37 a description of the altar of incense. Uh, This is where incense was offered to God. Like I said, this goes on chapter after chapter after chapter, detail after detail after detail, description after description after description, and each one serving a purpose. It is intentional. It's no mistake. It's no, okay, God just wants you to quickly add this. No, no, no. It has meaning. It has purpose, and we should take note of it. Let's jump over to chapter 38. In this chapter, we're informed of the objects that were associated with the outer court of the tabernacle. So we have the altar of sacrifice. This is verses 1 to 8. This is where they would make sacrifices that that were brought to God. Then you have the bronze basin. This is where the priests would come and wash their hands and feet before they conducted their priestly duties. Verses 9 to 20, we see the description of the construction of the courtyard with its pillars and its linen fence. The rest of chapter 38 is the inventory of the materials of the building of the tabernacle. People and items both laid out, both being communicated, saying here's how we are going to build this beautiful tabernacle of the Lord. Exodus chapter 39 describes the making of the priestly garments. 
I want to encourage you to go and read it and study it. It's absolutely fascinating. The detail is incredible. And again, each one with purpose and meaning. One that we're actually able to trace throughout the scriptures. Then at the end of Exodus chapter 39, verses 42 and 43, Moses looks over all the work that has been done. And then these verses give us an overview of the construction project. Uh, Let me read them to you. Verses 42 and 43, we're told, the Israelites had done all the work according to everything the Lord had commanded Moses. Moses inspected all the work they had accomplished. They had done just as the Lord commanded. Then Moses blessed them. See, God commanded it, and so under the leadership of Moses, they did it. They obeyed. So now in chapter 40, the setting up of the tabernacle is what we see. The assembling of it. It's like they had built each component individually, and now they're going to put the whole thing together as a collective whole. So the first five verses of chapter 40 describes how the furniture and the tabernacle tent was arranged. Then in verses 6 to 11, It tells us how these items are arranged in the tabernacle courtyard. And then verses 12 to 15 remind them of the ceremonial practice to consecrate the priests for service. And permit me to read this portion because I love it so much, right? So verse 15, I think it's incredible. It says here, anoint them just as you anointed their father so that they may also serve me as priests. Their anointing will serve to inaugurate a permanent priesthood for them throughout their generations. I love that. That that, that Moses, in a sense, led slaves out of Egypt, but these slaves were becoming a priesthood, if you will. If we go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it's where we are told that if you are a Christian, you are a priesthood of believers, a royal priesthood. And we see it here, all the way back in Exodus chapter 40, verse 15. And so the tabernacle is almost ready. It's almost ready. And so from verse 16 to 33, Moses does the final touches, right? The the, the final things that need to happen to the tabernacle to now have it ready for operation. So let me read these verses to you. I ask that you follow with me. Exodus chapter 40 from verse 16. It says, Moses did everything just as the Lord commanded him. The tabernacle was set up in the first month of the second year on the first day of the month. Moses set up the tabernacle. He laid its bases, positioned its supports, inserted its crossbars, and set up its pillars. Then he spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering on the tent on top of it, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Moses took the testimony and placed it in the ark and attached the poles to the ark. He set the mercy seat on top of the ark. He brought the ark into the tabernacle, put up the curtain for the screen, and screened off the ark of the testimony just as the Lord commanded him. Moses placed the table in the tent of the meeting on the north side of the tabernacle outside the curtain. He arranged the bread on it before the Lord just as the Lord commanded him. He put the lampstand in the tent of meeting opposite the table on the south side of the tabernacle and set up the lamps before the Lord just as the Lord commanded him. Moses installed the gold altar in the tent of the meeting in front of the curtain and burnt fragrant incense on it just as the Lord commanded him. He put up the screen at the entrance of the tabernacle. He placed the altar of burnt offering at the entrance of the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, and offered the burnt offering and the grain offering on it, just as the Lord had commanded him. He set the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it for washing. Moses, Aaron, and his sons washed their hands and feet from it. They washed whenever they came into the tent of meeting and approached the altar just as the Lord commanded Moses. Verse 33, next Moses set up the surrounding courtyard of the tabernacle and the altar and hung a screen for the gate of the courtyard. So Moses 
finished the work. The detail. The detail. I absolutely love it. God is intentional. And so now it's complete. Moses finished the work. It's now complete. The Israelites have completed this building project. It's been signed off and it is now ready for occupancy. Now, before we go there, did you notice a phrase that kept coming up when I read those verses? Just as the Lord had commanded him. This should remind us of one of the themes of Exodus, which is obedience. We've been navigating through the book of Exodus and we've seen multiple themes. and One of them is obedience. And, and here we see it, even in the building and the completing of the tabernacle, over and over and over again, we see this phrase, just as the Lord commanded. God gives commands and we obey. Even Jesus tells us the importance of obedience. We see this in John 14, verse 15, which says, if you love me, Jesus is saying, obey my commandments. Many of us say we love Jesus, but are we obeying his commandments? How are we doing in that department? Jesus says it again. He brings up this issue of obedience in John 14, verse 21. He says, those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. Do you love Jesus? Obey his commandments. And because they love me, my Father will love them. And I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. Obedience is important. It's it's crucial to our faith because it reveals that we love God, that we love Jesus, that we love the Holy Spirit. Now, before you think, here we go with all that obedience stuff, let me say this. We are all obedient, all of us, regardless of whether you are a Christian, whether you follow Jesus, whether you've surrendered your life to him, All of us are obedient. We are all marching to the orders of someone or something. So I just want to put it out there, right? If you have an issue with obedience, the question is, who are you obeying? Because because all of us obey. All of us obey. That which you are obeying, is it leading you to a life of, of contentment, of joy, and of hope? Is it? And if it's not, then I would I would I would encourage you to turn to Jesus because. If you obey him, that is what you will find. Life, purpose, and meaning. Now, the last few verses of the book of Exodus describe what happened when it was all complete. When they finished the work of building the tabernacle, the question we should ask is, what happens next? Well, let's take a look at verse 34 and 35. Verse 34, it says, The cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. See, God was pleased with the obedience of Israel. There's a real and significant connection between the continual mentioning of the obedience of Moses and Israel, as the Lord commanded Moses, as the phrase goes, and then this remarkable display of glory. There's a massive connection there. Don't miss it. We shouldn't think that Moses or Israel earned this display of glory because of their obedience, but yet we should see it as their obedience welcomed it, that they didn't earn this, but but their obedience welcomed it. Verse 35, it says, Moses was unable to enter the tent of meeting, Uh uh-oh, because the cloud rested on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now, this is very similar to what happened to Solomon when he completed and then dedicated the temple to the Lord. It says, the glory of God so filled the temple and they couldn't stay in it. We see this in 1 Kings chapter 8. And so without the glory, it's just a fancy tent. They've completed this beautiful building, but, but, but without the glory of the Lord descending upon it and dwelling in it, it's, it's just a really, really cool building. The same could be said of a church building. The same could be said of a home. The same could be said of a human being. Without the indwelling glory of God, something profound is missing. And so my question to you is, do you feel like something profound is missing from your life, from your marriage, from your relationships, from your work? Is something missing? 
There's something profound missing from our society. I feel like that sometimes. And, and so we, we need to ask the question, what are we missing? What's going on? Why do we not feel the, the presence of God and his glory? I wanted to make mention of that. But the other question that I think we should ask, and let's be real and ask this question, is why could Moses not enter the tabernacle? Right? Like, like it makes no sense. He's, he's been obedient to God. He's taken every instruction that God has commanded them. They've completed the tabernacle. It looks amazing. The glory of the Lord descends and it dwells in there. Like, why can Moses now not go in? Because up until this point, Moses has had a really close relationship with God. He's had VIP access. But now, nothing. He can't go in. See, if we read the rest of the scriptures, if we continue from Exodus 40 and we make our way to Leviticus and so on, we'll see that it takes all of Leviticus into the beginning parts of Numbers for Moses to finally gain access into the tabernacle. A whole book, the book of Leviticus, a whole book, it takes all of that into the beginning of Numbers before he gains access to it, into the dwelling place of God. And so what happened? What happened? Or maybe a better question to ask is what needed to happen? Right? What needed to happen to move us from Moses not being able to gain access to the tabernacle to him being able to walk in in what we see in Numbers? What needed to happen? The answer is Leviticus, the book of Leviticus. And so what is Leviticus all about? Well, if we were to study Leviticus and don't panic, we're not going to do a sermon series on the book of Leviticus, though it is a great book. Uh, if we were to study the book of Leviticus, we'd see that it's about how God provides a way for sinful people to live in his holy presence. That's what the book is about. If I was to summarize it in one sentence, that's what it is. It's about how God provides a way for sinful people like you and I to live in his holy presence. And so God is holy. Right out the gates, that's that's what we should see, that God is holy, which means that he is set apart. And he is set apart because of his unique role as creator and author of life. Now, because God is holy, this means that the space around him is holy. And so if he, he descends and, and dwells in the tabernacle, now that tabernacle is holy. It's no longer just a really cool building, but no, 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 it's a holy place. It's full of his goodness. It's full of his purity. It's full of his justice. But Israel, on the other hand, Israel is corrupt and rebellious and sinful. And so if they want to live in the presence of God, they too have to become holy and just. That's the only way that it's going to work, that God and sin cannot exist in the same space and so therefore their sin has to be dealt with. Even Moses, even Moses, his sin has to be dealt with. And so enter the book of Leviticus. In a quick summary, Leviticus gives us three main ways that God provides Israel to live in his presence. Remember we said, uh, if we were to summarize the book of Leviticus in one sentence, it's about how God provides a way for sinful people to live in his holy presence. And so the book of Leviticus gives us uh, three ways that God provides this for the people of Israel. Number one, in the book of Leviticus, we see rituals. God gives rituals to the people of Israel, rituals to practice when they are in his presence. This includes various sacrifices of thanksgiving and confession, grace and justice, we also see the practice of seven annual feasts in the book of Leviticus, which tells me that God loves to celebrate. God loves to party. He's given seven annual feasts. That's seven reasons in a year to party. And so we see rituals that are given. You want to enter into my presence, my holy presence? There's some rituals that you're going to need to practice. 
we also see the need for priests who act as mediators between God and the people. God, God, God says you're going to need to appoint some priests who are going to act as the in-between guys. And so we see Aaron and his sons being ordained as the first priests. And we also see the qualifications of a priest. They are called to the highest level of moral integrity and ritual holiness. And they are to represent the people to God and also God to the people. And so we have the rituals. God says, you want to be in my holy presence? There's some rituals that you need to obey. And, and then there's some, some priests. You need to appoint some priests who are going to act as the in-between guys. And then lastly, we see the call to purity. The call to live a life of love and goodness and justice. We see ritual purity and then moral purity. they things that they are to abstain from, right? And, and that's where uh, we see in the book of Leviticus, and this is probably where Leviticus gets its bad rap from. It's like all these foods that you cannot eat and how you're not supposed to wear certain clothes. And all of that points to, these, to, to ritual purity, that God's calling the people of Israel to live a life of purity. But then moral purity. So there are things that you are to abstain from and then there are things you're supposed to do. This is where we see justice and, and how we're to love one another and care for one another. And so God says, you want to be in my presence? There's some rituals that you need to perform. You need to hire some in-between guys. And you need to live a life of love, goodness, and justice. Do these things and you will enter into the presence of God. And if you want to see if it worked, then we should go to the scriptures. You see, they finished the tabernacle. Leviticus chapter 1 verse 1 says this, Then the Lord summoned Moses and spoke to him from the tent of the meeting, telling us that he could not gain access into it. It was from the tent that the Lord spoke to him. Then we have the whole book of Leviticus. We wrap it up, we jump to Numbers, which is the next book. So Numbers chapter 1, verse 1. After doing all these things that God said, hey, if you do this, you will gain access. You will be able to be in my presence. Here's what Numbers chapter 1, verse 1 says. The Lord spoke to Moses in the tent of the meeting. There's some things that needed to happen. Even though the glory of the Lord had descended, had filled the tabernacle, we still couldn't gain access because there were some things that needed to happen for us to be in his presence. How does Moses move from being, being outside to being in? Leviticus. But what about us today? So, so I see that for Moses and for the Israelites back then, but, but what about us today? Because if we read Leviticus, it's evident that we don't do half the things that are in that book. So, so should we be concerned? What does that mean for us? How do we enter into the presence of a holy God? Our answer is Jesus. It's Jesus. Because Jesus perfectly fulfills each required ritual. Because Jesus is our perfect mediator. He is the great high priest. Because Jesus lived a holy, perfect, sinful life. Everything that was required in Leviticus, Jesus perfectly fulfills. And he did so on our behalf. Jesus is our tabernacle. He is where God dwells. And don't just take my word for it. Let's read Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. It says, For God in all his fullness was pleased to live. Other translations say dwell. He was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. H how do we get in? Through Jesus. Through Jesus. But wait, there's more. Where does Christ dwell? In us. Right? So, so God dwells in Jesus. But where does Christ dwell? In us. Now, I know... He, He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Scripture tells us that. But through the Spirit, He lives in us. For all of those who've crossed the line of faith, for all of those who look to Jesus as Lord and Savior, He lives in us. He dwells in us. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 to 17 says, I pray 
that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, it says, Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you yourselves not recognize that Jesus Christ is in you, unless you fail the test? Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Where does Christ dwell? He dwells in us. He dwells in those who look to him as Lord and Savior. And so if God dwells in Christ and Christ dwells in me by the Spirit, then that means God dwells in me. All of this, all of this is to get us to this point. The building of the tabernacle, God coming down, God saying, Moses, you can't gain access. You've got to do all these things in Leviticus. And only then will you gain access into my presence. And then seeing Jesus as the fulfillment of Leviticus, all of this is so that God might dwell in us. He dwells in us. He dwells in the church That means his love and goodness and patience and kindness and justice and mercy and grace and glory dwells in us. God went from a a tent, a tabernacle, to a temple, right? If we continue to read the scriptures, they went from building the tabernacle to building the temple. So God goes from the tabernacle to the temple to Jesus to us. We can trace it throughout the scriptures. In fact, in the very last chapters of the Bible, John writes about his vision of heaven after Jesus returns in his second coming, Revelations 21 and 22. In this vision, he sees an extraordinary picture of the new city of God. But but something is missing. It's obviously missing. For for everything John has grown up with, he grew up with the temple, right? And and he gets this vision and he sees this new city because the temple was was the focal point of the city. It was where people went to go meet with God. But now he's like, man, this new city, something's missing. There is no temple. There is no temple in this city. Why? Well, it's because Jesus is right there with his people. Jesus is right there with his people. As we look to the end of the story, what we lost in the beginning is now restored. What did we lose? God dwelling with his people. We go all the way back to Genesis. Right at the beginning, God dwelling with his people. But because of the rebellion and sin of humanity, there is separation. And so now God begins this mission. What's the mission? to dwell with his people. In the book of Exodus, he establishes a tabernacle and he says, listen, this tabernacle will go with you throughout the wilderness. It's where I will be. You will come and dwell with me. You will come and be in my presence. But there's a number of things that you need to do. Nobody can just show up and be in my presence. We go from tabernacle to temple. Jesus shows up and he says, I'm going to demolish this temple and rebuild it in three days. So he wasn't talking about brick and water, he was talking about his body because he says, God dwells in me, no longer in the temple, but now in me. He defeats sin, death, and Satan. He is now seated at the right hand of the Father. He sends his spirit who now dwells in us. The mission has always been for God to dwell with his people. And this has been made possible by the accomplished work of Jesus on the cross. This is why it's so important for us to surrender our lives to him. You want God to be with you? You want God to be with us? We've got to surrender our lives to Jesus. God wanting to be in relationship with these people. That's what the book of Exodus is really about. In fact, We could go as far as to say that's what all of Scripture is about. God is our Father, us as His children, dwelling together through Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. I've just summed up the entire Bible. 
But because of our sin, there is no way for us to enter into his presence. And so the high priest, the ultimate priest, Jesus Christ himself, steps in and makes a way. Now, let me wrap up the book of Exodus. Let me close all of this down. Let's jump over to verse 36. The Israelites set out whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle throughout all the stages of their journey. They recognized God's presence, and they were like, well, wherever we go, pick up the tent, pick up the tabernacle, and we go, because we want to be in the presence of the Lord. Verse 37, if the cloud was not taken up, they did not set out until the day it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and there was a fire inside the cloud by night, visible to the entire house of Israel throughout all the stages of their journey. See, the glory was so important to Israel, it guided them. It became their GPS, the GPS to their entire life. And when that cloud of glory began to move, they understood God wanted them to move. And when it stayed in one place, they understood God wanted them to stay in one place. Who are you taking your instructions from? Who are you following? Who are you trusting in? Who is your GPS? We also see the beautiful evidence that God did answer Moses' prayer that he lifted up to God back in Exodus 33, verse 14. God's presence was with Israel. Despite the golden calf fiasco, despite their rebellious nature and sinful ways, God's presence was with Israel. Israel. The book of Exodus ends with great hope and trust in God. Though Israel was in the middle of a desolate desert, had fierce enemies in the promised land waiting for them, and was easily tempted by sin, which causes rebellion and chaos, God was with them. And this gave them great motive for faith and confidence. It really did. It's what allowed them and motivated them to keep going. It should do the same for us. It should do the same for us. And, and so that is, that is I, I believe, God's message to us through the book of Exodus. Rooted fellowship, we should be crying out to the Lord, show us your glory. God, we will not go unless you move us. And if you move us, then we go. We want to be obedient to you because you are a faithful God. You're faithful to your word. You're faithful to your covenants. You will never leave us nor forsake us. Because of Jesus' accomplished work on the cross, we can now enter into your presence. That God, you are our Father. We are your children. You have so much in store for us. So much in store for us. If only we would trust and believe as we take those steps of faith in Jesus' name. And that's the end of Exodus. And what a series it's been. Absolutely incredible. And my hope is that you would be able to go back to this and, and be reminded of God's goodness and reflect upon his faithfulness and recognize the grace that he has poured over us. Praise God for the book of Exodus. Praise God for Jesus. And may we continually follow the Holy Spirit as he leads. Let's pray. And so, Father, thank you so much for this book. Thank you for your word, that it, it's active and it's alive and it continues to transform the individual lives of people. And so, God, would you continue to do so? What a journey it's been. feels like we were right there with the Israelites every step of the way, that there's so many things that we can relate to. Thank you that it is evident that you are a loving God, that you're a faithful God, that you're slow to anger, that you're merciful, that you're full of grace, that you're also a God of justice. We thank you for Jesus who stepped in our place and took the wrath that was meant for us. And because of him, we're able to be reconciled back to you. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that is active in all of our lives. I pray, Holy Spirit, you would meet us where we are, but you would not keep us where we are. That just like the Israelites, we would be moving forward on our way to that which you have promised us. 
Father, we love you. We praise you. Continue to do a great and amazing work through our community and beyond. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen.